Good afternoon, and welcome to our continuing weekend celebration marking the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum. I'm Tom Schwartz, director of the Hoover. When I was a kid growing up in Illinois, I had the good fortune of knowing both sets of grandparents, a wide array of aunts and uncles, and even a great-grandmother. Holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries always brought the family together including an assortment of friends and neighbors who adopted themselves into our family. All gatherings comprised plenty of food, beverages, and endless conversation. Some stories were retold so often as to become the basis for family lore, while others surfaced for the first time, adding new fodder for the growing corpus of family legend. That's the idea behind today's event, a gathering of the Hoover family those of blood lineage, and they are here today, Andy, Jeannie, and Margaret. Stand, please. <laughs> and then uh, the rest of us, those who adopted themselves into the family through their efforts to create the birthplace park, and those who worked at the library museum. I hope the two panels, through shared stories, might evoke a sense of the dreams and aspirations the founding generation felt in creating this complex, the joys and frustrations of establishing the library museum, and navigating the rapids as directors with many challenges and changes in the presidential library system had to face. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the stories. Our first panel is comprised of a distinguished group of local historians and former archivists at the Hoover Library Museum. Francis Abel, Audrey Kofo, and Mike Owen all contributed to this wonderful history of West Branch, which, by the way, is available for sale in our museum store, <laughs> if you are so interested. Uh, really, this is, this is a terrific uh, history of, of the 150 years of West Branch that it issued in 2001. Uh, they will offer their own unique perspectives on the connections between the community and the library and museum. Dwight Miller and Pat Wildenberg both were longtime employees of the library. I'll now turn the program over to Mike Owen, who will preside over the first panel conversation. Mike? <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, when uh, Kathy Grace told me about this. I was really excited about this program because when my wife and I moved here in 1993, see, I'm really, I'm really an Iowa City kid, born and bred, but, but uh, I've become a West Branch kid. And when we moved here in '93, uh, I really enjoyed talking to people who've been around town for a long time, and I see a few of them out here in the audience. Um, talking to them about their memories of the town and especially all the things that were going on in the creation of the Hoover site and the library museum and uh, it's it's been fascinating and so I'm really looking forward to this panel to hear what the panelists are going to have to say so I'm going to pretty much try and stay out of the way and uh, make sure that they get a chance to talk about their memories and and you know, they, Francis and Audrey both, you really should know, there are a lot of people here who, uh, who've been around for quite a while too. They're going to check your stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to want to hear, uh, make, sure, make sure you're on, on point with the facts here. Um, so let's start out by uh, finding out what are, what are your personal and family connections to uh, the start of the the, the Hoover site and the Library Museum in you know, West Branch. Audrey? You want me? Sure. Well, I was born during the Hoover administration. Slide line. Slide line. Slide line. I was born during the Hoover administration. Hold it for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to this. <laughs> 
once again, I'll start. I was born during the Hoover administration and have always lived within walking distance of this site all of those years. So I feel this is my neighborhood. Um, in 1948, when Mr. Hoover came for a birthday observance, I, I marched in the West Branch High School band. And in 1954, when he came to dedicate our Herbert Hoover School, I was a teacher there, and we all stood in our classroom doors, and he walked up and down the hall and shook everyone's hand. Uh, my father was part of the original birthplace society when the Hoovers came to buy the birthplace and get it started. And also my brother-in-law, his parents were caretakers uh, when they had a caretaker's cottage for the Hoover cottage. and. So both he, John Thompson and my dad, L.C. Rummels, were part of the Birthplace Society. In fact, my father helped purchase properties around the Birthplace to enlarge the park. That was in 1946. The town has always been proud of Hoover's, and if there has ever been animosity, it was not toward the Hoover uh, Museum and Library. It may have been toward the Park Service. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, I remember one of the remarks Mr. Hoover made was when he decided to put his uh, library here was he didn't, did not want to overshadow the history of the town, and he was instrumental in getting a group together to start the West Branch Heritage Foundation, which now uh, owns a museum downtown with local history, and with the help of some grants, they are refurbishing their building and will soon be open again. In 1962, when this building was dedicated, uh, my husband and I and our three children lived in the house that's still there across from the association. And so I'm sure we were in on everything that went on that day. And since 1963, we have lived on the north edge of the park all of these years. So I am a frequent visitor almost daily for my walk through the park. So uh, we have been closely related. Um, when Mr. Hoover was buried, uh, we remember the crowds and the solemnity of the time. And presidents that have come and gone, Mr. Truman, Mr. Eisenhower, Mr. Nixon and Julie, LBJ, and Mr. Reagan have all been here at times during the past. Um, the thing I like best about the Hoover Muse Library and Museum in the last uh, years was the ability for them to put on uh, special exhibits and special events to make it more uh, conducive to people to come and enjoy. And I think right now the continued good relationships between the Library Museum, the Hoover Association, <coughs> the Park Service, and the City of West Branch and Main Street West Branch, that this cooperation has been wonderful and we hope it will continue into the future. Thank you very much, Audrey. We'll probably go into some of those uh, memories more specifically here in a bit. Francis, what is your connection to the and memories of the start of the library museum and the site? I have no connection or family connection to uh, uh, 
the Hoover site and, and legacy. But I came here by way of, uh, of uh, arriving in 1954 and uh, became uh, the ag teacher here for uh, 38 years. And so uh, uh, I was fortunate when I uh, got this job because it, it was a historical town and I had great interest in history by that time. Not while I was at home on the farm or in high school or such or even in college at Iowa State, but I got drafted into the army and was overseas with NATO at Verdun, France for a year and a half. And so uh, I, they had a great library there and I started reading Lincoln and the Civil War. And then on weekends I traveled all over Western Europe to see all the World War I and World War II battlefields. So. When I arrived here in West Branch, I thought, oh, this, I can carry on with history, you see. And tonight, or this afternoon, I mainly want to, I prepared to tell you about how well the Library Museum and the National Park Service, too, cooperates with the community in events and in projects. And I'm going to talk about two projects then. Uh, and I've got it written down here. I don't have a teleprompter. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is the Memorial Day 1995, <clears throat> whereby we honored the World War II veterans on the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, I felt that we should do something and so I talked it up a little bit, at coffee and so forth, and, and I talked with, uh, with uh, Tim Walsh about it. And he said, well, we can use the library and the auditorium here and any of the facilities we want to. And Tim strongly suggested we have it on Memorial Day, which was a good suggestion. And the weather had been ornery for every weekend prior to that, but it was a nice day, and we were blessed in that. The American Legion helped me with the planning, and briefly, the old veterans and their spouses met at the bank parking lot, and we had a parade uh, down here to the front of the library, led by the West Branch School Band, and we listened to the appropriate music there, and Tim made a nice address out there appropriate for the occasion. Then we came in here and uh, listened to uh, three veterans. Uh, one of them, his name is Clark, who was an editor at the Tipton paper for many, many years, and another one uh, from Legionnaire from Southern Iowa, explaining about the meaning of the war and, and such. And we had a three county uh, this event this was, and we had someone from each county, I believe Bruce Jeffries did it for, for Cedar County, reading of the people that didn't, veterans that passed, that deceased in the war, and they had the taps and, and so forth. And so that, uh, I really appreciated the use of the site here and what Tim suggestions and so forth. It was, it was a good day. And then we'll go to the second activity. And that happened because we knew that the sesquicentennial for West Branch was going to occur on 2001. And so myself and several other history-minded ones decided we'd better get on this project quite early. So in 1998, we convened up at our public library, I believe, and uh, I had thought, well, we'll do a, a video, you know, and some of the sites and, and such, but John and Audrey Kofoy brought books that had been done uh, on uh, the history of a town, and right away we said, we want something permanent, and we want to head with it. Okay, and uh, so once again, I consulted with Tim Walsh, and uh, he said that all of the 
materials they have here, and they've got every West Branch newspaper from day one, and uh, lots of other things that's been noted, uh, donated rather, and so the group of us, or probably a dozen of us, we must have spent hundreds of hours down here. Pat Wildenberg can attest to that, <laughs> and these two staff members uh, to that. And uh, so we had it finished in time for the sesquicentennial at Hoover Day in 2001. And uh, we, uh, besides, I want to mention also that the State Historical Society was very helpful with, with materials and as other community members too. But uh, we had that, we sold lots of, of uh, editions of it, over a thousand probably now. No advertising, cost something. <laughs> but at any, any rate, some of them said we ought to, uh, to maybe uh, uh, put this out for award competition. And so we did, and we won the Lauren Horton Award for the best historical town history in 2001. We were urged to put it in on the national level, and we did. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 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 you know to say it. <laughs> uh, and, and we did, and uh, they don't have a national, overall national board, it's by regions. We won the Midwest region, which comes from the border of Canada to the Gulf. And so uh, we're pretty proud of it, and I'm especially happy how the museum here, and library, and the National Park Service cooperates with the community. I hope that other national libraries do some of this sort of thing also. Maybe not because we're a small community and everybody knows everybody else, uh, that, that it's, we can have more of that. But it certainly was appreciated by me and all of the, the people that were involved in any event here. So thanks a lot, okay. Tim, and the rest of you. you bet. That's the two events. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go a little bit into some, some little detail maybe about some of these events. Um, I saw a picture, I think it was on Facebook the other day, either on the museum's page or on the West Branch Times site, of the groundbreaking. And uh, I know one of the people in that picture was Floyd Fawcett. And one of... Uh, Floyd's famous remarks that he made to me more than once is, nothing comes easy in West Branch. <laughs> so, but in this case, something really big came to West Branch. So um, with that groundbreaking, do you remember, um, were, were either, well, Francis came in 54, but the groundbreaking, let's see, the groundbreaking was in 59, so you were, you were both here at the time. You, were you both present for that, or do you remember any... I think I was in the classroom probably of what okay. was going on, but I don't know. It may have been on a weekend, but I yeah. think it was during the week. Remember anything about the groundbreaking itself? I don't remember a specific, okay. but living so close, we came most every night to see what had been done. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, how about at the, the dedication of the library in 62? That was in August of 1962. Do you remember anything specifically from those events, from the ceremonies, or? <coughs> we were used to Hoover celebrations. There were always crowds around, and by living so close, it spilled over into the street and the yards, and so all we had to do was sit at home. <laughs> well, actually, that's one of the things that occurred to me is that we, um, when the when the library museum was built, did that make a substantial difference in the, the feeling of the presence of the Hoover legacy here? Because uh, I know there was there were things that went on for many for many years, uh, but there have been you know almost probably thirty years between uh, the beginnings of this project and. Uh, and the campaign kickoff that was done on Oliphant Street Field, which was great pictures of that in 1928. Um, 
did, did there make did there seem to be a big difference in the the presence that this changed things about West Branch? Or no, about I think Boston? Mr. Hoover had been here many times and. and we were always happy to see him, always had big celebrations when he came. And so I think it was just one more good thing okay. that happened. Um, well, listen, you probably were both, go ahead, Francis. Mike, uh, I wanted to interject about, I don't need a mic, I'm used to <laughs> talking <laughs> out enough. They probably, they, probably do for, they probably do for recording orders. Oh, I see, all right. <laughs> Uh, I knew they were going to get everything right here because I remember seeing when this was in construction a big platform on stilts that held something up there and I was told by some construction people that there was sand in there and they were seeing how well the where the foundation would be how well it would support things and so uh, I learned something there, and I knew they they meant business, you know. So uh, uh, I do remember that, and driving by and seeing the progress, you know, as it came along, and and so uh, really looked forward to all of the when all the presidents were here. I was down here all the time. <laughs> it may have brought my father up from uh, down by Mediopolis to get in on some of it, you know, and so it it was a uh, a nice thing to see unfold. Okay. Well, there's there's one uh, event that actually I remember even having grown up in Iowa City, and that was in October 1964 uh, for uh, President Hoover's uh, burial service here. Um, lots of people. I remember. I just was kind of young, but uh, I remember we had to be far enough. You actually had to have binoculars to see what was going on. But can you remember some uh, something about that? Some where, where were you that day if, if you were in the crowd at the at the burial and uh, any memories from that? My memory is I took a blanket out and sat at the bottom of the gravesite <coughs> quite a ways away from the big crowd because I had my Girl Scout den with me, and so we uh, watched the burial from down by the creek. Okay. Yes, I too was in attendance and uh, uh, had some of my own relatives here too. It was a really a, a huge uh, crowd uh, uh, at the uh, the burial thing, and it was always interesting for me to to get in on these national things. Boy. I had uh, become a staff member uh, officially July the 1st of 1964, and uh, that was obviously uh, the first really big event at the Hoover Library during my tenure here, 35 year tenure. And um, we had a warm up uh, the week before. We didn't realize it at the time, but Don Johnson, uh, one of the local uh, sons, uh, had become, uh, had been elected uh, national commander of the American Legion. So we had a big parade, we had a program in front of the library, we had the stage, we had speakers and, and all of that sort of thing and things went off pretty well and then uh, the word came from, uh, from uh, New York that uh, uh, the big event really was on and uh, the library staff of course had a very nominal role in all of that uh, once Alan Hoover said uh, once that uh, um, it, it, it went underway, it was an army show. The army planned everything. And uh, they told you where you wanted to be, where you wanted to go, what was going to happen next. And so you just went along with the flow. And, uh, but I was there. The library staff um, assembled and marched, uh, not marched, we walked from the library up to the uh, Overlook as a group, 
and um, we had uh, pos uh, positions uh, within the, the circle uh, off to one side. As I recall, everyone had black armbands. Uh, it was a most impressive ceremony. Um, the uh, uh, military escort brought the family up, then the uh, uh, honor guard carried the casket from the base of the hill up to the graveside, um, which was just a kind of a some semi-level place at that point. And uh, the interment occurred, and um, and we there we went. But looking out over the sea of faces was just remarkable. There are some said of estimates as high as 25,000 people. You could not see a bare patch of ground from looking out toward the library, toward past the library, toward the uh, the gates into the park. You just there was it was just a sea of faces. Uh, it was most impressive, I must say. Um, I can't think of uh, much more detail that would not already have been published, or, uh, uh, but that's just my own personal impressions of, uh, of that day. And uh, um, do you I recall, think I'll, do you recall, I'll uh, any of recall who some of the dignitaries would have been who came? Um, some announced, some announced, unannounced. One unannounced was Barry Goldwater. Uh, he did not choose to turn this into any sort of campaign event. Uh, he was. You have to remember, this is in the middle of the 1964 campaign. Right in the heat of the campaign, and uh, he uh, was there sub rosa. He was. Uh, we did not know he was at the library that he was there until after the event, and it came out in the media then that, uh, that Barry Goldwater. Uh, the usual complement of, um, of politicians, other than that, state politicians, national politicians. I can't Harry remember. Truman here? I'm sorry? Uh, Harry Truman here? Harry Truman was not here. Uh, his health was uh, an issue, had become an issue at that time, and so he was unable to attend, but he would certainly have been here, I know. Uh, he and, well, that. Uh, that gets into some uh, stories that will come out later on as far as the relationship between uh, Harry Truman and, and Herbert Hoover. Um, but that's a kind of an overview. Was President Eisenhower here? No. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about some of the some of the dignitaries that have been here over the, over the years. I mean, <coughs> Well, I might, before, might add that President Eisenhower was here along uh, a year with uh, Richard Nixon at the dedication yeah. uh, of, the, of the National Historic Site. Yeah. That was in 1965. Yes. Um, well, let's, let's start. Let's start with that one, because that actually had some community aspects to it. I know that uh, uh, apparently uh, President Eisenhower and former Vice President Nixon at the time uh, he was. They, they both came to the August 1965 uh, dedication of the National Historic Site, and um, there was a lot going on that day, but it looks like. I mean, um, I don't know what some of you folks remember about that, but one of, one of my favorite stories when I came to town that I heard about on this was from Murray Gibson. Now, Murray was the postmaster at the time, and there was uh, a special stamp for President Hoover that we probably all have seen. It was dedicated, I believe, that day as well. And in the lead up to this, now I don't know if he was looking on toward his legacy or what, but I guess President Johnson was keeping pretty close tabs on making sure that the launching of that stamp, and probably other things going on here, but Murray was getting questions from President Johnson. He'd call him on the phone. Mr. Postmaster, he'd say, <laughs> Everything going to go smooth, <laughs> smoothly. Um, but what were, what do you remember maybe about some of that day? Uh, again, uh, both uh, Mr. Nixon and uh, yeah, President good. Eisenhower were both at that event. 
a lot of the activity uh, came out of the library, uh, operated out of the library, and uh, uh, we had a, uh, this was long before the uh, current configuration of the building. Uh, the loading dock was right out here, and uh, we had a uh, uh, special uh, stamp cancellation station there. Uh, you could actually buy stamps and uh, have your first day covers uh, stamped with the uh, first day of issue uh, cancellation. And uh, that was a, they did a brisk business uh, uh, selling stamps. Uh, certainly Murray Gibson uh, had uh, more than he had on, he had special help. They had, gosh, I remember uh, what uh, they took on at least, what, four or five uh, additional or temporary help, and they were in the uh, upstairs of the post office building and just canceling stamps. Uh, you, you, you would buy and you, you buy the stamp at the post office and uh, put it on your cover and leave it there. And you'd have it self-addressed, and uh, the post office then was supposed to cancel it. Well. There's no way that you could hand cancel all of those at the post office, so they had a special station set up over the post office, which uh, it was in the American Legion building at that time on Main Street, and uh, they well, had. I think several of the women of the Heritage Foundation. I couldn't remember who all they were, but uh, I recall my mother was up there. Yeah, they were you know canceling away. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, quite, quite, I don't know how many tens of thousands of uh, envelopes. But interestingly enough, uh, Murray had that. He, he retained one first day cancellation stamp. Not, well, you know, the, the rubber stamp. Uh -huh. And uh, he had that for weeks <laughs> after. <laughs> so if you had can, yeah, if you had somehow or another uh, <laughs> acquired some uh, sort of thing that you think it would be neat to have uh, with the first day uh, cancellation on it, old Murray would uh, give you the, the, do the honor, so to speak. Well, you know, they, they also that day, they did have to involve the community a little bit uh, in, in another way. They had um, uh, President uh, Eisenhower and Mr. Nixon were both uh, hosted by the Stolke family at their home on right. Northside Drive before some of the events went on. So yeah. at least the way uh, uh, Mrs. Stolke had uh, described it to us one time was that uh, President Eisenhower went in for a nap and Vice President Nixon went in and worked on his speech. <laughs> so they had a, a home base, but that house is still standing over on Northside Drive. And that actually, uh, that was perceived to be one of the times where really uh, Richard Nixon was making his comeback. Yes, that, that speech was part of the the relaunching of Richard Nixon. I had and three uh, years later he was elected. I had the pleasure of giving him a tour of the uh, archives, and uh, he was attended, took in, presumably, for I to say. Mm -hmm. Thinking on down the line, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have my own library. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some people know, you know, uh, Mr. Nixon, that wasn't his first visit to West Branch either. No, no, he was here as, as an airman uh, when uh, he was at well, uh, some way station. station. And in, and 19, had, well, even and in 1937, that. he came back through here with his family after attending law school at Duke. And they, they came back through West Branch on their way back to California because uh, Mr. Nixon's grandmother was from this area. And in fact, she's buried out at Scattergood. Her name was Hope Hemingway. Wasn't the Hemingway family related? Yes, Hope, Hope Hemingway is her name. Dwight asked me to talk a little bit. I, I handled all the audiovisual, all the photos. And when these people are talking about these events, I wasn't here. I was just a baby, so to speak, in this group. But uh, I did have to take care of those photos in the film. And uh, it was 
rather incredible the quantity and the quality of so many of those old photos. And I was thinking when you were talking about Nixon's connection, uh, we do have a photo of him visiting Millhouse, uh, which was uh, his maternal grandmother. Uh, and that was, I think, 37, something like that. Uh, but uh, all of these things, these events, are all documented, uh, particularly the funeral. I mean, there is so much stuff uh, that it's actually overwhelming if you want to try to go through it all. But they did document it. It's part of the history of this institution. It's part of the history of this town and part of American history. So uh, all that stuff survives. Mm -hmm. And that's the, our, that's the mission of the library. One of the missions is to save all this stuff so that it can be studied and, uh, in the future. And those people who weren't at these events get to know a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. so. One of the uh, one of the, my favorite pictures that I think is in the collection that you discussed is when uh, President Johnson came here after uh, about a month after he left office mm -hmm. to like what was he what was he doing checking out what a presidential library should be or well, this, getting ideas for his own yeah. or this uh, the, I was of course was here for that too mm -hmm. <laughs> anything after 1964. Uh, I was around for, but uh, 1965, uh, uh, his health uh, was uh, still, what had become something of an issue, and he was en route uh, from Texas to uh, Mayo Clinic for a checkup, and uh, he decided to make a very quick stop at uh, the Hoover Library, and uh, so this... Uh, military jet uh, drops down in uh, Cedar Rapids and he comes down to West Branch and uh, uh, he gets a quick tour and uh, by this time it had been announced and the media was swarming around this place because he had been very tight-lipped after uh, he went back to Texas from Washington and uh, this was his first press conference, his first open mic press conference uh, after the, the presidency. So there were many questions that people had to ask. And I don't pretend to uh, remember much about that, um, other than the fact that he looked very tired toward the end of it. It was almost an hour in length. And uh, uh, someone was uh, whispering to Lady Bird, saying, maybe we ought to shut him down. He's, he's looking fatigued. And uh, he says, oh, it'll end when it's supposed to. And within a few minutes, uh, someone jumps up and says, thank you, Mr. President. And that was it. Um, another visit after, after that was, uh, sometime after that, was in 1992, after the, when the uh, museum was renovated, and, uh, and President Reagan came. So what, what did folks remember about that, Audrey and Francis, do you remember anything about that day? <coughs> well, I, I, I was there, of course, and uh, listened to what he had to say, and, and uh, uh, it was well attended. There were lots of people there, and uh, that's about all I've got to say about that. <laughs> okay. I was there. <laughs> I remember when they presented the miniature replica of the birthplace on a slab of marble, mar marble that some of us had received in donating for some of the construction. And I was impressed that he has the same thing I have on my shelf. <laughs> I remember the pictures showing him getting that. Of course, now I guess he had he had lunch on that trip over at the Hamburg Inn in Iowa City, and they oh, always yeah. everybody always says about that is he ordered his pie first. He wanted, <laughs> he wanted dessert before he had his lunch. <laughs> so, um, 
I'd like to go back for a minute. One, another another picture. I remember Pat would remember this from the collection of the photos, but the, it's been published a lot. Is the the picture outside the front of the uh, museum when it was dedicated, which in those days was on this side of the building, or excuse me, was on, on that side of the building. <laughs> Turn around a little bit in here, um, where there's these throngs of people. And then there's this tiny little path. I mean, I can't imagine a presidential event or a, anything involving even former presidents not giving them a little bit more space than that. <laughs> then uh, that's not the way you do it now. But there's this, this tiny walk for uh, President Truman and President Hoover walking down this path. I don't know how much security there was there <laughs> in those days, but just throngs of people. On that, uh, I wasn't here for the dedication, of course, but the path I remember because the path was all flagstones. And I know that it was just laced with fossils. I mean, just incredible uh, fossils in these flagstones. Huh. And that path remained until, I don't know, probably about 73 or 74 when it was replaced with the big sidewalk. But before that, it was just a curvy, Flagstone walk to the front of the library and then over towards the birthplace, in front of ISIS. And uh, it was, uh, I think it was replaced for safety reasons because it was not an easy thing to walk on. Yeah, I was going to say, especially if it, if it was damp <laughs> and <Yeah>. wet. <laughs> oh, my, that was a health hazard. And, uh, something that the uh, Park Service had uh, their eye on immediately. And as soon as they could muster the funds together to uh, get rid of that, uh, that very picturesque uh, uh, flagstone uh, walkway, they, they got rid of it. And it would have been terrible to try to push a wheelchair on, try to walk on with crutches. All of those things that just militated against keeping it. But that was part of the joy and part of the aura of the site. It was very down-home, low-key, comfortable place. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Okay. What are the, uh, what are the feelings, uh, Audrey and Francis in particular, what, what are the feelings you believe that community has for the Hoover site? I believe Audrey in one of uh, your stories in the book, uh, you mentioned that there were some mixed feelings at some point and that actually uh, President Hoover felt that there might be some mixed feelings in the community and that this led to the creation of the Heritage Museum downtown. Uh, can you go into a little bit about that and what, what's, what were some of the feelings in town? I think it came about when they started buying properties because uh, before the park was enlarged there were houses up by the association house, two other houses, and across the street, which was our main way into town where the traceway is now, then that whole street was filled with houses. And when they started buying those, I think that's when the real uh, contention came about. And that was actually when the Park Service came. Earlier, when they bought property along the north fence and to the west here for the loop road, the old fairgrounds. Uh, I think then sometimes people weren't sure how much it was going to take and, and those landowners probably weren't anxious to sell their farm fields and so on. So I think there was some of that just like there probably is even today with expansions. Audrey, uh, wasn't there uh, uh, not problems, but indications that uh, commercial interests were going to move in on uh, uh, what, uh, what is now uh, a space uh, on, both sides of, on both sides of the creek, actually, that uh, 
Uh, the sign that I seem to me remembering a hue and cry about a tasty freeze across from a birthplace cottage, but I think that there were other, <laughs> other people making motions toward uh, doing that. I think the birthplace foundation uh, acted, acted quickly on that uh, in an attempt to uh, forestall uh, that kind of commercial development. Well, and I think that's when Mr. Hoover said, didn't want no, to take microphone. over. <laughs> I think that's when Mr. Hoover made sure that uh, that his property and so on would not overshadow the town that the, right. that the Heritage Foundation yeah. should As I recall, preserve. they wanted to initially build the library on top of the hill uh, toward, the, toward um, Downey Street. Uh, up, up probably uh, where that farm is up there, that that was, and he absolutely vetoed that. He said he would not have his library uh, overlooking West Branch. But that was the logical place for it. They could have had a basement. Um, here it is uh, in this uh, creek bottom, and, uh, <laughs> and you know the rest of that story. Imagine uh the word taxes came up even. Uh, reduced tax base because of the properties no longer there, you know. And, and so uh, a little of that type of stuff went on too. Didn't did, amount to anything. But. Did, uh, did there seem to be good cooperation from the community in trying to help secure the vision for this whole complex? <coughs> As far as I know, there was. I remember at one time, uh, especially soon after they bought the birthplace back, the family, uh, they had some of these plans and the birthplace society was insisted that the town be uh, informed of what was going on and not kept in the dark. And so I think they've made every effort to include the townspeople as much as they could. Both of you have been involved with the schools, and I'm on the school board, so this is something that interests me. Um, from the early days, was the museum seen as a good resource for the schools as well, the local schools? I know that uh, the, visit, the, the visits from school groups has always been an important part of Museum school groups from across the state, but uh, locally, I can remember you know seeing seeing the kids walking down single file from the elementary school down down to the park and to the museum. Unfortunately, I didn't stay around as a teacher long enough okay. to make use of the library, but I do know that many people even today will say, "Oh, I came to Hoover's when I was in fifth grade," so that seems to be the that a, a lot of schools come. I don't know how much it is, but I, I see the buses and the tours. And I think it's a real good source. That was an annual trip from the, uh, the trip from the, was it fifth grade, I suppose, at Springdale uh, when I was here. And I remember talking to uh, the fifth grade class from Springdale on an uh, annual basis. If, from a community standpoint, if you had one wish or vision for the library museum and the complex, what would it be? What, to take things further. We are where we are, but what would you like to see happen? Well, I think to continue the cooperation between all the entities in town has been wonderful up to this point, and I would hope that could continue. Our last week we had Hoover's Hometown Days in which every organization, Hoover's, Main Street, City, all cooperated and had a wonderful uh, celebration that included our old Hometown Days and Hoover's birthday and so on. And I would hope that continues. Francis? That's exactly what I had written down. That's my answer for that question. We continue the, the cooperation on events and 
and the use of resources. It was wonderful. Well, it seems like a good segue for for Pat and Dwight for having they had had many years here. Um, we'll start with that question. Based on your foundation of knowledge and experience here, what would you like to see happen in the future? More of the same, or are there other areas where you'd like to see some um, new things happen? Well, I, my personal feeling is that I like seeing the associations that have occurred through the years. Uh, I like seeing the town and, and the library and the park and the association joint sponsoring events because I think it helps, it helps everybody. Uh, people will come to the library and end up at that party in town or they'll come to the party in town and end up at the library. It's, it's a mutual benefit of everybody. And I think it's very important that this institution doesn't get isolated from the community. I think that's extremely important and has to be in, in anybody's planning stage or planning uh, ideas. You can't allow it to happen because if you do, it will shrivel. I mean, uh, the institution will still be here, but it's just... It has to, it's a symbiotic thing that has to be maintained. Again, Pat, what, your, your role here was for how long and what? I'm the baby in the group. I didn't come here until 1970. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was here for 33 years as an archivist. For the first 22 of those years, I handled all the audiovisual, the film and the sound recordings and, and uh, uh, still photos. And my main job there was keeping them, trying to keep them from destroying themselves. Uh, those materials are very fragile, and if you ignore them, they will indeed go away. So that was my life for 22 years. And then the last 11 years that I was here, I was in the reading room. But through all of these years, uh, I was, as I was talking to Tim Walsh here earlier, his son remind, remembered the first time he met me, and his Tim's son asked me what I did at the library, and I said I was the jack of all trades. And his son went home saying, I want to be a jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cool. But I was the jack of all trades. We have, you talk about the events in 70, um, I most often was the one that had to get all the equipment set up and, and deal with all the technical issues. Uh, I remember Ronald Reagan coming. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is, I did get to be in there for the picture. I did get to meet him. But that was just kind of a little brief moment uh, while uh, I had all these other things to do. You know, there's things in Iowa City and here, and everything had to be recorded and all that stuff. But I was the jack of all trades. Uh, I was. My position at the library was doing those things that others either it distracted from what they were wanting to do, or uh, I had a science background, which is unusual, so I, I handled technical things. Uh, but it was my whole life was meeting everybody's needs, and it was great. It was great, great fun. Uh, had a lot of fun times, um, and it ranged at every. I did everything I think in this institution, but work at the sales desk. <laughs> uh, you know, it was two years at, towards the end of my career, with as a, my side job uh, was building manager. We didn't have a building manager, uh, and uh, I dealt with things like broken windows, and air conditioning, and heating plants, and all of this stuff. But I, I, I think I had the neatest job in the world. And the neatest people to work with, uh, this, this group of people here at the library were incredible. We were a small institution doing a really big job. 
And in order for that to happen, we had to have everybody working together. It didn't matter what your job description was. It was when we needed hands, we needed to do something, everybody got involved. Now the beauty of that, not only did it build a lot of good feelings in staff, sometimes some not so good feelings, but you know, <laughs> but generally good feelings, not only did you do that, you also, we were able to do something that's very unusual, particularly within the federal government. A large number of our staff people started at the sales desk and ended up in really nice, good, responsible positions within the whole of the library. That is so unusual, but because we were a small group and we had these big projects we had to do, everybody had to do it, and in that we discovered talents. And we had the directors with the wisdom to see that this person has that talent and develop it and get them promoted into a professional level on that talent. And uh, that's an extremely unusual thing in any institution, particularly a federal institution. But it was a great group of people to work with. Uh, I don't think, I, I was thinking about this earlier, do I want to say we're a big family? And I said, no, it's not truly a family. Because in a family, you have an obligation of having to be together. Here, we had these people from all these different backgrounds choosing to be together. We had very little staff turnover. I mean, uh, I, I was here 33 years. Dwight was here 34, 35 years. Uh, Dale Meyer was another archivist. He was here 33 years, 32 years. Uh, Cora down there, I don't, I don't know how long Cora was here. A long time. Uh, but we had, our staff stayed because we wanted to stay. We wanted to work together. And they also stayed because they felt an obligation for this place. This was our place and we really did give a damn so how many people here have worked at the hoover library or at the national park but if you yeah good we uh dwight from your from your years so tell us some of the things that you did and i talked to dwight a little bit before this there's he has some good stories about some collections that he came across in his... Yeah, um, we talked about the, uh, the job description and all of that sort of thing. And um, I'd first preface those are my remarks by uh, piggybacking on uh, one of the comments that Pat just made. And uh, the job description uh, may have had some high-flown language about professionalism and doing this, that, and the other thing. and. Uh, then it comes uh, time to uh, give tours of the World War I exhibit, and uh, you will give a tour. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yes. <laughs> um, and Christmas trees. Yeah, everybody had a Christmas tree. The staff each had a Christmas tree to decorate. Yeah. Uh, didn't that seem like a far cry from uh, the historian archivist uh, position that I had? But the thing of it is, uh, we had a lot of fun doing it, and uh, it's not the sort of thing you did every day, after all. But for that week or two out of the year, uh, it broke up the monotony. Of, if there was any monotony in your job, there's precious little because you had so many different responsibilities. And that was one of the great things about working at the Hoover Library that I did not see in all of my associations with staff from other presidential libraries. There was not that variety of responsibility. And that kept you fresh because one day you're doing this, maybe you're doing it for three or four days and something else comes up. Wow, here's another avenue, another little... Uh, a brush fire that needs to be tamped out, 
so you had all of these uh, various and sundry uh, responsibilities that, that came to you as, as necessary. Um, as far as my particular duties as assigned, um, I guess you could put it pretty much in one sentence um, to um, acquire historical materials, to prepare them for the use of scholars, and to assist scholars in uh, their use of those materials in the manuscript reading room and by, uh, by mail. And that pretty well sums up what I did for 35 years. And um, some of the more rewarding aspects was acquisition of historical materials. And uh, some of those were, uh, were interesting day and very interesting times, and not in the Chinese sense, may you live in interesting times. Uh, the, these were a lot of fun people. These were people who knew Herbert Hoover in, in the early going. Um, and they had Hoover stories to tell, and uh, we had uh, uh, we had some great lunches. I'll say that everybody <laughs> wanted to go to lunch, and uh, uh, so it's, uh, it, it was a uh, it was uh, it, it was a, a good time in, in that respect. And uh, what's your most memorable lunch, Dwight? Oh, the memory. There's well, that's like asking you to which one of your children you like this. <laughs> uh, you can divide that into categories of uh, uh, presidential period, obviously the Hoover Papers, uh, which were here for the most part uh, when I arrived, um, but they came in bits and pieces after that. I wouldn't be surprised, but we'll get some more Hoover papers here. What do you think? Huh? <laughs> um, I think that um, the uh, the Project 95, when it comes to acquiring Hoover materials, Project 95, and Richard can speak to that, and uh, as will uh, Tim perhaps, um, but that was a program that uh, provided monies to send library staff to the Hoover Institution uh, to uh, review the Hoover Papers and associated collections for materials that would be of research and reference value at the Hoover Library. And what this did was to allow us then to review the Hoover Papers still at Stanford and make Xerox copies. Not on not a highly selective basis, but if you needed the whole folder, copy of the whole folder, and they did. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, program, and as a result, we have, I think, a probably a 98, 99% unified Hoover collection at the Hoover Library. Um, when it comes to the presidential collections, um, one comes to mind uh, that has been oft quoted, it was cited yesterday evening, um, Theodore Joslin papers, and that was a remarkable uh, acquisition. Very small, probably no more than five or six document cases. It's less than, uh, uh, well, we're talking about three feet of papers. But the Joslin diaries um, are a treasure beyond measure uh, because they record uh, one of his closest associates uh, uh, activities with Herbert Hoover uh, on a daily basis for over two years, the last two years of the Hoover presidency. And uh, that, uh, and that is uh, valuable beyond measure in, in people who are doing uh, research uh, on Herbert Hoover and uh, what happened inside the White House during those last two years. Great, great collection. Arthur Ballantyne, less dramatic, but probably uh, fully as valuable in a uh, research uh, standpoint. Um, Arthur Ballantyne was the Under Secretary of the Treasury uh, in the last year of the uh, Hoover administration, Assistant Secretary of Treasury prior to that. His collection, substantially larger, and also a gold mine 
and there have been PhD dissertations uh, written in large part from that collection. Um, then there, there, there are many others. Um, uh, Burke Hickenlooper, uh, one of Iowa's favorite sons, uh, a voluminous collection that was winnowed down to about 980 document cases uh, from another, you know, probably four or five hundred that were disposed of, that were duplicates, newspaper clippings that have either been, uh, or I probably most of them on microfilm, readily available, so uh, that sort of thing. Uh, um, we choose not to occupy uh, uh, valuable archival shelving. Um, in the, uh, the non-political um, or governmental executive uh, uh, area, one of the most heavily used collections in the entire library. Uh, up until a few years ago, it was used more than uh, the papers of Herbert Hoover, and that was the papers of Rose Wilder Lane. More specifically, uh, her mother's papers, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And uh, we built a cottage industry around that collection. Uh, I don't know how many special exhibits uh, that brought in school children. There were school children across the state that were holding uh, everything from car washes to cookie sales to bake sales all over to drum up the money to buy the gas and to, to get to the Hoover Library to see the, the Rose Wilder Lane uh, exhibit. It was, uh, it was a, a remarkable collection and uh, it, it kept that reading room drumming for uh, quite a number of years. Those are just a few. Uh, I don't want to. Great. Uh, there are some yeah. How many collections now? Over. What? Took. Took. Come on, where's Matt? 300. Huh? 300. 300 collections? Some of them are smaller than others. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there were, I think there were more than that when I left. Uh, but anyway, no mind. Um, there, are, there, are, there are so many broad and varied collections that uh, it, it defies description. Uh, so I'll, All right. I'll, I'll well, let we, it we go. We have, I believe, about five minutes left to discuss things, so we're going to oh, have to... I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, we covered a lot, and, and it, was, it was good getting the perspectives of you folks and talking about some of the same questions that the community panel had. Mm -hmm. um, some of the... Uh, there's been many changes here, both physical with the facility and uh, in the management of the Hoover Library. What have been, some, in your minds, some of the more significant changes well, that we've seen? One of, from my perspective, and what I did here, um, probably one of the most dramatic, is um, the transition from uh, coming to the Hoover Library reading room uh, to examine the collections and uh, taking material offline provided by the Hoover Library, and that's one of the large, uh, one of the major activities, as I understand it. Uh, is putting more and more and more and more material online for scholars to use uh, that will um, uh, not uh, well enable them to get the necessary information without uh, uh, having to engage in ever increasing more expensive travel. And, and maybe being online is, makes it more available, not just to. Well, I'm old school, actually. Uh, uh, no, I am. I, I got a very brief uh, encounter with all of that. Um, we did a collection. Um, that is, we were uh, instructed to uh, go through and assemble a hundred of the most important documents on a given subject. hundred, hundred documents, the most important. Well, you go, you're rummaging through there, and you go, wow, there's a nice one. Pull that out, copy it, goes into the research folder, but fold up the rest of it, and you go to the next one. Well, um, that, in my opinion, 
was the most important document in that folder, but to researcher X, he's coming here, he says, I'd sure like to see that document in its context, in other words, what came before it and what went after it. And, oh my, for my particular interest, the stuff that came before it and came after it was full as important as the document that you chose. So you're missing a lot, folks, by not coming to the to not this reading room, but any reading room, and looking at the at the original documents in their in their context. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about this in, in your transition. That's an incredibly good one uh, from then and now. And one of my other part-time jobs was computers as well. And so I was very involved in it. But Dwight is so correct. And as people who are historians or archivists, we understand, and people doing history should also understand, everything is in a context. And if you take and high grade this and this and this, yes, you can get some valuable information, but you're getting it out of context. And uh, it kind of goes against our training and against our native curiosities to just be happy with that. And that's one of the downfalls. Now, there's more and more getting on the computers. And there will continue to, that'll continue to mushroom. Uh, one of the things that was very important is that we got all of our finding aids on the computers so that a researcher doesn't have to come to Hoover Library to just find the lists of what files we have. He can do that on the computer, do that at his own base, can question the library on these materials via telephone or, or uh, letter, but you still need to make this trip one way or another. Uh, to look at this so you can look at it in context. We do a lot of educational programs. That's something that really sprung up more as Dwight and I were walking out the door. And, uh, you know, the idea is to get these kids interested in history. And it's great to show them these great little things. As long as their teachers at home or somebody, be it staff or somebody else, point out to them that this is only part of the big picture. And what you see here, that's that's nice, but why did it occur? That's what you want to know. What's that you want to find out? So. I hope we have a couple of minutes so I can ask one last question here. What's the best kept secret about this place? What have you, what have you, uh, what did you discover in your time here that you haven't had a chance to well that actually all four of you. Yeah. If you have if you have something I'd think everybody would like to hear it. Well, you guess to start with me. Nobody else seems to want to. <laughs> the best kept secret, I think, about this place is the Hoover family. These people and there get three of them here, and, I, and I'm sorry if it's embarrassing to you. We've learned the Hoover family will come and be of service. They will help us. And if we're doing something that they aren't quite agreeing with, they will try and will work with us to get it right. Uh, I was thinking of a story. Uh, of what happened to me. Many years ago, we had an exhibit on Hoover Dam, and uh, Lowell Thomas did the narration. And one day, Lowell Thomas was here, and Alan Hoover was here, and uh, since it was one of the Hoover Fest things, I was in Iowa City setting up equipment, and I was all sweaty, and I had trans, you know, it's August and hot. And I got back to the library, and I was in a t-shirt and a pants. And uh, I had a message the director wanted to see me out by the exhibit, because they wanted to know how many times it had played. And I had a, a calculator on there, and they, like 50,000 times by that point. 
And I gave him the information and I retreated back and I got cleaned up a little bit, got a shirt on and a tie and a jacket and I came back out. And Alan Hoover came up to me and just said, that's much better. <laughs> he wasn't going to criticize me. He wasn't going to criticize or rebuke me for being really in crappy clothes and filthy out there in the museum. But what he did was complimented me when I had rectified it. And this is this is very much in my mind uh, my experiences with the Hoover family as a whole. They will provide some leadership, but they will provide an awful lot of support, and they won't hit you over the head. Uh, you know, they will kind of nudge you to go where they want to go. Uh, and it, and it makes it great. I mean, I think a lot of the libraries, the other presidential libraries, have tremendous problems at times with their families but we just haven't had here, and that makes it nice. That's that, cool. That's one thing I wanted to say. The whole Hoover family is gracious. We knew Alan very well, and we know Andy and his wife and Margaret very well, and the boys. They've been wonderful to come and give moral support and friendly, and uh, I think it's wonderful that they are still involved. Dwight or Francis, did you have No, I could, uh, I could surely echo uh, Pat's sentiment. I, I will echo, echo uh, Pat's sentiment uh, in that respect. Uh, I guess I knew everyone practically. I never met Mr. Hoover. I came within uh, an ace of meeting him. Uh, I came to New York, to the Waldorf, to interview Mr. Hoover for a job. That was back in the days when uh, they just didn't take anyone off the street. They wanted to look them over. <laughs> who I'd gone up to New York with from Washington, um, went in and spent about an hour with Mr. Hoover about library matters and that sort of thing. And Ellen Hoover came out then and said, uh, Dad is too tired after uh, all of the exertion with, uh, with the library director. This was 1960, uh, or this was early 1964. This has been uh, like April 1964. And uh, so I interviewed with Alan Hoover, and uh, I passed muster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that, um, from that just progressed on. I met uh, Herbert Hoover Jr. at his office in uh, Los Angeles uh, in 1967, and then just you know the rest of the family from from there on. Uh, right up to, up to the present. And they've all been most kind and uh, most supportive. And uh, that's always deeply appreciated by, by staff. Understatement. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Picture. What have we done? <laughs> okay. We promise. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> Dwight has a story to share that will shed light on the cultural interaction between uh, the library in its earliest phase and the local community. Well, the story that Richard refers to, uh, uh, I, I probably told him that, and someone must have told him that story years and years and years ago, and it's, it wasn't, didn't happen quite that way, but the, it, generally <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, the uh, West Branch in, in, in 1962, 1960, somewhere along in there, was not, um, well, it, it, it reflected its rural center. 
It was a very rural place. It was so rural that Roland Lallier, the first library uh, director, uh, said he wouldn't live here. <laughs> and, uh, and he did. Um, he, uh, he, he bought a house in, in, I in Iowa City. Uh, the second, the, his successor, um, who hired me, uh, said, you will live here, because I'm living here, and all of the staff are going to live here. How about that, for a turnaround? Well, uh, he, he had some stories to tell, of course, about his interaction with uh, people in the West Branch community. And um, I wasn't going to bring this up because I didn't know how well it would be accepted by uh, members of the community, but this is a story that was told to me by that library director. And uh, he said that uh, he was having a party and uh, he needed some camembert cheese to go along with some fresh pears that they were serving. So he goes down to the Royal Blue and uh, I have, that brought a chuckle out of the audience. You remember what the Royal Blue was, okay. Went down to the Royal Blue and uh, asked uh, for some camembert cheese and said, what, what, we don't know what that is. What, what is that? And he explained that it was a French soft cheese. And, oh, all right. We don't have it, but we can order it. And um, a week later, um, call up, says, your cheese is in. And so he goes down to pick it up, and he said, just casually commented that it seemed like a week was a quite a long turnaround on getting some cheese. And he said, well, actually it's been in for a few days. But so many people around town were so interested in what camembert cheese is, we had it on display. <laughs> well, uh, West Branch has come a long, long way. <laughs> in terms of uh, its level of sophistication, and I think we're all very pleased about that. Well, you did get it out of it. <laughs> all right. Well, on behalf of our panel, I'd like to thank Tom Schwartz and the folks at the Uber Library for making this opportunity available so we could talk about some of these things. Could you please give a hand to Audrey Kofo, Francis Abel, Pat Weldenberg, and Dwight Miller.